For 100 years, this IAFF has done whatever it takes. From the very first convention, when those 36 delegates from chartering locals across our two countries assembled in Washington, D.C. on February 25th, 1918, which culminated three days later in the birth of our great union at 2 p.m. on February 28th. The written history of the floor proceedings from that first convention, the delegates made it very clear that this organization is built for the purpose of advancing conditions of firefighters. And sisters and brothers, this week at our 54th convention, we're going to be doing just that. We're going to be just as clear doing whatever it takes to make sure this International Association of Firefighters remains strong, remains bold, a true trade union to represent the interests of those engaged in this honorable and dangerous profession of ours. Those leaders back then, those who lit the torch of our union's journey in the final year of World War I, leaders of individual cities across two great nations, did whatever it took to organize and build a single, stronger, international union that would serve and protect one of the greatest memberships in the world. The work of our courageous forefathers who stepped forward at a time when there were few of any labor protections for workers. They set our union's compass on a path to do whatever it takes to grow this IAFF in membership, financial strength, political power, and influence. They pushed their municipal gov governments hard, and they organized new members city by city, state by state, province by province, demonstrating the power of unity, of solidarity, and of collective action. We grew decade by decade, undaunted by the Great Depression and recessions, two world wars, multiple military conflicts across the globe with so many proud veterans coming home to trade one proud uniform for another, joining our ranks. We continued to grow through turbulent times, facing down attacks by government bureaucrats and political cronies, leaving our local leaders with little choice but to strike in so many of our great cities like Chicago, Memphis, Kansas City, New York, San Francisco, up through the late 1970s and early 80s. And today, we're still fighting against too many anti-union forces as we protect our members' pensions, labor rights, and safe working conditions. Just think, from the 5,450 members this IAFF represented at its inception in 1918, to growing to 90,000 by 1958, 154,000 in 1986, and today, 313,000 strong. This union's been built on the shoulders of, of those who unquestionably did whatever it took including our 15 Ameritai officers that we were introduced this morning to you. And each and every one of them, each and every one of you that's here with us today, we deserve to give you our sincere thanks for everything you did for this IAFS. Thank you for your history and your work. And today, as we look ahead to the next 100 years, as we chart the course for the next century of progress through unity, we have an incredible team that will do whatever it takes to continue moving us forward. My union partner, your GST, Ed Kelly, smart, tough, innovative, creative, a true labor leader in every sense of the word, is doing whatever it takes to ensure your $68 million is managed with great care and invested wisely. He's maximizing our internal operational efficiencies so that more and more of our members' hard-earned resources are invested in them, invested in you, invested in the future of this IAFF. 
Our 16 vice presidents who make up our executive board, introduced by the videos, are the very best, sent from every district across our union, committed to establishing the policies that determine the next set of tools, systems, services, forums, information, everything we deliver, and ensuring these services are provided to all of you. The incredible staff that we have assembled at headquarters in Washington, D.C., and Ottawa, each the most skilled, capable, talented, accomplished professionals within their fields of expertise. They do whatever it takes to turn the ideas and policies, goals and missions established into the extraordinary services and resources that we now provide to our affiliates. And to all of you here, and those not with us today, our affiliate leadership across two great countries. And as I've said for decades, with the toughest, toughest job in this union, over my 42 years now with this IAFF, I've watched you in awe and with great admiration. I've watched you battle the battles, to face the tough work. I've watched the work that you do, the commitment that you make a great sacrifice to yourselves, doing whatever it takes to represent our members' interests while too often getting your ass kicked from some of those members of yours who demand that you do more, and at the very same time getting hammered and threatened by con and confronted by chief officers and elected officials as you fight back against those trying to force your members to do more for less. Yes, it's this great IAFF, all of us together, fighting against the forces arm in arm, back to back, against those who want to turn the clock back. This IFF of all of ours, united as one, standing ready, willing, and able to take on all who want to take a piece of us. And in this crazy political environment in which we currently find ourselves with high animosity, with divisiveness in politics ruling the day, with extreme partisanship that allows little to get done, while the forces of power and wealth want us to become nothing but a footnote in history, we have to be ready to do whatever it takes to prevail on behalf of the members of this IAFF. And let me say to those who are hell-bent on making us that footnote in history, like Alec, the Koch brothers, the Arnold Foundation, the Pews, the Mercers, the Murdochs, the National Right to Work Committee, and ICMA, and so many other anti-union forces. We will stand up to the hundreds of millions of dollars you bring to the field to try to kill us off. We'll battle you in every arena, political, legislative, regulatory, and as well as we'll fight you in the courts, because we've got what it takes to win and to what it takes to fight back. So let me ask you, do they scare us? Hell no, they don't. Because just like our members, and we've got to remember this every day, just like our members do, facing extraordinary challenges, life-threatening moments that most can't really conceive outside of our business. And when adversity is staring them down, when their backs are up against the wall, what do they do? They raise their game to another level. So by God, as long as our members to continue to face the beast, crawl down those hallways, repel from those heights, pull their fellow citizens from the worst moments of their lives, battle Mother Nature at her, at her most ferocious, like the thousands of our members are doing all across the West. You can be sure that this IAFF, and I know every one of you, will be ready to fight on their behalf. And when the dust settles, and a hundred years from now, and when many of those adversaries are going to be long gone, this union will be standing stronger than ever, doing whatever it takes to take care of our members. And you can take that onto the bank. So as we, uh, as we continue to, to face you know, our cause, 
we are just simply not going to tremble and retreat because our enemies think that the recent Supreme Court decision in Janus will be the beginning of our demise? No. I'll tell you what I believe this 5-4 decision will really do. It will encourage us to forge an even better connection with our members. It will make us even more unified. It will make us stronger. It will strengthen the bond, the family that we have on the job, the very glue that holds us all together, standing together. And in that same spirit, as leaders of this IFF, we will do whatever it takes to keep this family strong, to fend off, off those who hope the decision will divide us. Now, I know how proud you are of this union. I know the pride, the success of this IAFF of ours that we all hold. But you recognize that while the labor movement overall, unfortunately, continues to struggle in too many places, with membership on, in so many sectors on the decline, with our union density in the United States, sadly, right now, at only 12% of the workforce. Together, we've been doing whatever it takes to continue to grow our union virtually every year, over the years, every month. Now with 3,401 local affiliates, 313,536 members today, Members strong, representing 86% of our workforce in the U.S. and over 90% in Canada. We have built the highest organized workforce in the land. And let me add that last October, we welcomed back with open arms our brothers and sisters from Montreal, Quebec. 2,400. 2,400. French-speaking firefighters once again within IAFF Local 125, represented at this convention for the first time in 44 years. And let me say to them, Bienvenue, Chavo, à la IP. Welcome home to the IFF. So as we face our challenges and pursue the opportunities that lay ahead of us, we'll keep our focus on the critical goals established at that first convention in 1918, when the delegates developed our first constitution and bylaws, clearly stating the objective of this union with the adoption of Article II, which included, and I quote, the fostering and encouragement of a higher degree of skill and efficiency maintenance of proper remuneration for duty performed, social and economic conditions, conditions elevated, and the health and future safety of its members preserved. That article set our course for these last 100 years. And all of us together have been doing whatever it takes to improve our members' lives economically and to improve their hours and working conditions, to create and maintain the sound and secure retirements that they can have after a career of service. And as we work to keep our members safe, it's important to also embrace and love our proud and honorable symbols and traditions that we hold so dear as we send one of our own home after they've made the ultimate sacrifice with every bit of profound respect. We celebrate our fallen with our honor guards at attention in their dress blues. The mournful tunes of the pipes and drums play, the fa flags lower to half staff, the black buntings on the rigs, the ribbons are across our badges. And the stunning memorials are a, simply a true testament to their service. But our single most important goal is not, and I am not to just be focused on etching their names on these beautiful granite walls that we have in Colorado Springs. Rather, it's to keep them alive, to keep them healthy through their entire career. And we've been working hard to do just that. And as you saw in our history video earlier, the IFF has created an advanced 
so many different initiatives, wellness, fitness. We work tirelessly to improve the PPE our members wear, the apparatus they ride in, the equipment they use. We fought for and won the development of those national and international standards that increase and protect staff staffing levels. We've built the state-of-the-art databases and GIS capabilities and a cadre of experts to challenge any consultant in North America who proposes to cut your personnel and your communities. We've developed the largest hazmat CBRNE uh, response programs in both nations. We created the training and made a protocols that saves their lives when everything goes to hell in a handbasket so quickly through our fire ground survival program. We're leading the way in pursuing research that shows the link between the environments our members work in and the unacceptable number of cancers that they contract at much higher rates than the general population. We're taking on the chemical industry to remove the flame retardants from the furniture, wall coverings, carpets, everything in this hall and in the homes that becomes nothing less than a toxic stew when they burn. We're building programs and procedures for prevention and decontamination and partnering with pioneering researchers to ensure our members have access to the most advanced diagnostic and treatment tools. And just when everyone thought that Washington, D.C. was so screwed up, the lawmakers there couldn't get anything done, this IAFF got something done. We pushed Congress to pass a bill that will finally provide the research and medical community the data they need to address the exposures and to make that undeniable link between the jobs our members do and this cancer epidemic we're experiencing. And just three weeks ago, President Trump signed that bill into law, establishing our National Cancer Registry, a major achievement for generations of our firefighters to come. We're taking care of them. Simply put, we're doing whatever it takes to keep our members healthy and alive. And now on the front line for our members who are dealing with the deliberate, deliberating uh, behavioral health issues, you know how we've been focused on the effects of post-traumatic stress now. For years, we, we have been developing and training CISM teams and LEAP you know, teams and committees and supporting the efforts to help our members. But we also began a new and critically important chapter right here on the floor of our convention four years ago. We started the discussion that recognized the link between the incredible trauma our members experience on a regular basis as part of the job and the effect it has on them as human beings. We started talking about those exposures and how they were linked to mental health disorders and that they're experiencing a significantly higher rate of mental health disorder than the general population. And they're experiencing the associated co-occurrences, unfortunately, of alcohol abuse and drug and other addictions. It's simply a horrific and tragic fact that right now we have more members killing themselves by suicide than we lose to fire ground deaths. So what is this union going to do? I'll tell you what we've done. And that's whatever it takes to help save their careers, save their families, and save their lives. We're bringing this silent injury out of the shadows and into the light. We're eliminating the stigma that was associated with emotional and mental health that's been driving our members into the dark for far too long. We've created a peer support structure that now has trained over 2,400 behavioral support peers because we know our members are more inclined to speak and talk to one of their own than be sent to some random psychologist or psychiatrist. We're going to continue to advance the enactment of state, provincial presumption, and worker comp laws that recognize behavioral health disabilities and post-traumatic stress as an occupational injury. And we're established our Center of Excellence, the IFF Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health Treatment and Recovery, the first occupational specific recovery center ever built where only our members can receive the care and the treatment that they need and deserve. 
And I know we all take such great pride that our center now, in its first 15 months, has already helped to save over 430 lives, lives of our IAFF family, something we can take great pride in. With all that we've uh, built within this union over these 100 years, nothing is more critical to our members' future than the work we do in the political arena at every level of government in both of our countries. And regardless of this crazy political moment we do find ourselves in, we're not going to be pulled into the social and cultural wars that are taking place between two ideologically extremes of the far left and the far right. We're not going to get caught up in the hysteria that's driving today's narratives. We're not going to just resist for resistance' sake. Our members don't want their union to be driven by rage, hatred, or rancor. Our political voice doesn't need to be shrill or ugly. Our goal, our job, our political philosophy is about working with those who will work with us, supporting those who support our members and this union's agenda on their behalf. It's not about America's Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, or Canada's Liberals, NDPers, Greens, or Conservatives. Our success is and has always been about finding that path to succeed, working with those that hold office to advance issues related to our members' jobs and their livelihoods. And we have a proud and clear history of doing just that, regardless of the party controlling the Congress or Parliament. We've been successful with friendly and unfriendly national governments, friendly and unfriendly presidents and prime ministers. Our experience is no different at the state and provincial levels. I've witnessed the work that you've done, the incredible advances that you've made, regardless of which government, governor or premier is in control. We've used our political resources to establish heart, lung, infectious disease, cancer, and now PTSD presumption protections. We built our retirement plans in the legislative chambers across both countries while fighting off attacks from our adversaries who still attempt to try to undermine or destroy them. So as we now work with a union-friendly Canadian prime minister, and we're dealing with a non-conforming, anti-union U.S. president. Let me make this very clear. We'll welcome President Trump's signature for our cancer registry bill, but we are not going to accept his attack on our federal members, and we're not going to stand for his efforts to strip our federal union leaders' rights away from them through executive orders. Period. The end. We will take him on. We'll take him on. We've taken him on before. For every one of us, for every one of us who holds a union position, we've accepted that responsibility. We've accepted that our mission has to be and is crystal clear. We've set our goals. We need to be prepared to both advance our causes while beating back the attacks. And each one of us also knows what it takes to get this work done in that arena. As I've stated over the years, it takes money, marbles, and chalk. It takes everything that you bring to play the game. And the issue that will be addressed by you tomorrow is are we going to pony up the financial resources that will give us the capacity and power to operate more effectively and play the game at an even higher level? Are we going to enhance our resources to the level needed in today's political environment so we can compete with the hordes of money that now flood the political landscape? Are we prepared to continue and grow our commitment to more and more fire-packed dollars going out to all of you in the field for state, provincial, and local campaigns? Are we going to enhance our support for the scores of ballot measures and millages and referendums that are so critical to our members' rights, jobs, and future back home? 
Are we going to grow our political training academies and the support for our own members as they run for public office with over 300 now elected, with Malin Richo getting ready to become the governor in Wisconsin and Danny Valenzuela getting ready to become the mayor in Phoenix and our own Michael Hurley getting ready to become the mayor in Burnaby? Are, are we going to step up to the plate? Are we going to increase the funding for our communication strategies for the online and broadcast and digital tools needed to engage and connect with the voting public? Are we going to enhance our political IFF gold and black brand that has allowed us to have the reputation of punching way above our late weight class? The powerful brand that is the creation of Firepack. These questions are pretty straightforward. Are we going to just rest on our laurels and congratulate ourselves on the work well done or our past successes? Or are we going to continue to build and increase that power? Because money and power in politics go hand in hand. And if the answer is yes, you'll answer it tomorrow by passing that fire pack resolution, which will put us one step closer to the day when we finally secure and celebrate a national legislative right that will once and for all guarantee that every IFF member will work under, negotiate a, under a collective bargaining agreement. That's how we get there. Yes, this week, uh, you're going to now become the founders of our union's next 100 years. You have the great responsibility of determining the goals and policies and the future path of this IAFF. What we do this week will truly set the foundation for the next century of progress through unities. Yes, sisters and brothers, it was over 100 years ago that the initial spark of unionism hit our profession. And over the next century, that spark lit the flame that has burned brighter and brighter as all of us together built this powerhouse of an IAFF. Now the challenge to be great for the next 100 years comes to all of us, all of you, everyone here in this hall. It's now your turn to be the pioneers. It's our duty to do even more to protect our members until they celebrate that second centennial. So let the light of the future shine bright on this union as we stand together in solidarity. Let's stand together for those who are riding the rigs right now. Let's stand together for future generations of firefighters who are counting on us. So will you stand with me right now? Because I'm damn ready to stand with you, I'll tell you that. Let's stand together for the greatest union in the land, doing whatever it takes to kick the shit out of those enemies and adversaries doing whatever it takes to build our political power to even greater levels, doing whatever it takes to protect the lives and livelihoods of our members and their families. That's our charge this week, to set the course for the next 100 years, doing whatever it takes. God bless you. God bless everybody on the front line. Let's get to work. <laughs>